In the middle of Colombia sits a small village called Armero, and above Armero looms a volcano called Nevado del Ruiz. Now this volcano, also referred to sometimes as San Lorenzo, is a over 17,000 foot volcano covered in glaciers. And in 1985, that volcano was responsible for the death of over 23,000 people in the town of Armero. Probably 3,000 or more just went totally missing. and topographic, guys. So now we have a rock. All right, guys, that's classic red bed. Now this volcano actually has a long history of destruction and even deaths. We have evidence of eruptions from 8,600 years ago and the volcano was responsible for deaths in the 1500s, killing over 600 people, in the 1800s, killing around 1,000 people, and of course, in 1985, killing over 23,000 people. Now, why did it kill so many more people in the 1985 eruption? Well, that's pretty much just because there were more people there. The population was somewhere around 30,000 people. So again, over 23,000 people was nearly the whole population. So what happened? Why did all these people die from this volcano? Well, just imagine a volcanic eruption. What do you think are the main hazards? Most people when asked this question think of ash and lava. And for good reason, ash plumes can tower into the atmosphere and travel really far from the eruption. Now this can pose a risk of suffocation from hot ash that's falling. But this risk would be primarily associated with the area close to the volcano. Even though the ash can travel far, it usually just falls as fine ash and, and people actually can broom it off their cars or sidewalks at that point. But they're unlikely to actually die from suffocation when they're far from the volcano. Now the other one is lava. And we can just imagine lava spewing and flowing from the volcano. But again, this hazard is primarily associated with close to the volcano. Now there are different types of lava that are important to consider here. Lava primarily varies on viscosity. So we have basaltic lava flows that are much more fluid and spread out. You can think of Hawaiian volcanic eruptions. This lava tends to move further and hence can pose a greater risk further from the eruption point. And we can also think of the uh, what's called flood basalts that have happened historically. We have records in places like Eastern Washington where basalt moved across the landscape at high speeds as well. But there's another type of lava and that would be rhyolitic lava. Now this lava tends to be much more explosive, but it also tends to flow more like molasses. So it doesn't travel quite as far from the volcanic eruption. And this would be associated with rhyolitic eruptions from volcanoes such as stratovolcanoes. So again, all of those hazards are close to the volcano. So you don't wanna be on the mountain during an eruption or you might be at risk for these hazards. But keep in mind, Armero was not on the volcano. So what happened? There is also pyroclastic flows, which involves ash and material, some of the blocks as big as cars, these rocks and debris tumbling down the side of the mountain as well. But once again, that material would be localized to the mountain and pose hazards for people that are primarily on the volcano. So what could possibly reach out from these volcanoes so far that it reaches towns many, many miles away? Well, let's pause here for a moment and travel all the way to the northern hemisphere where we can take a look at some other similar volcanoes and maybe see what's going on. Here we are in the northern hemisphere in the western United States where we can find a long chain of active volcanoes. These volcanoes are the result of what's known as a subduction zone where one plate is sinking below the other and it's causing a volcanic arc or this line of volcanoes. Now just five years before Nevado del Ruiz erupted, a volcano erupted in the United States, one of the first volcanic eruptions seen in modern industrial times. So it was pretty alarming. This volcano was Mount St. Helens. And in May 1980, a 5.2 earthquake occurred on the mountain, uh, signaling that it might be a volcanic eruption. And that is what happened. An ash plume went into the air and about a thousand over a thousand feet of material actually collapsed. Now what happened to all that material? Well, it came thundering down the mountain in an event called a lahar. 
This is a violent mud flow that's actually full of lots of material, more rock and debris than is water, but also when the glaciers melt, it combines and makes a slurry, a fast moving material that quickly moves down the volcanic slope and actually fills the river valleys around the volcano. And those river valleys have the potential to, to move that material all the way into far reaching towns around the volcano, like octopus tentacles reaching out from the now, Back in the southern hemisphere, just five years later, a similar thing occurred. It turns out it was those lahars that killed all those people in Armero. Now this is where the geology gets interesting because underneath the 1985 lahar deposit sits the other past lahar deposits, such as those from the 1800s and the 1500s. It turns out the town was literally built atop these prior mud flows. Now, unfortunately, due to some socio-political reasons, the town was not evacuated despite some warnings. Let's actually head back to the Northern Hemisphere to talk about some of the lessons we can learn from the Vado del Ruiz and this eruption that applies to some of those Cascade volcanoes. Now back here in the Northern Hemisphere, the Armero tragedy serves as a great lesson on why we should pay attention to these grumpy Cascade volcanoes who sometimes seem to just sit there quietly, calm and collect until suddenly reawakening. And it serves as an important lesson along with the Mount St. Helens 1980 eruption that we need to pay more attention to the potential hazards of lahars. Behind me, you see another volcano in the Cascade Range. Now, along with Mount St. Helens are several volcanoes all the way stretching from Canada down to California. And this guy is Mount Rainier. Mount St. Helens was over 9,000 feet before it erupted in 1980 and it lost about 1,300 feet of material. Well, this guy sits over 14,000 feet and is covered in more glaciers than all of the Cascade volcanoes combined. So the Lahar hazard with Mount Rainier is much higher. Here's a map of Rainier's river valleys reaching out westward from the volcano to any population centers, towns out there. Here sits Tacoma, Washington and surrounding towns and population centers. But could a Lahar actually even reach that far? Let's see if the rock record gives us any clues. If there aren't any Lahar deposits in the age of Rainier's existence, around half a million years in that area, then perhaps Lahars just don't reach that far. Geologists recently discovered a mud flow deposit that has the chemical signature of Rainier's material, and it was dated at 5,600 years ago. And it turns out that mud flow actually reached Puget Sound. It turns out a similar collapse event that we saw on Mount St. Helens and Ruiz volcanoes happened this time on Mount Rainier 5,600 years ago in an event now known as the Osceola mud flow. On the northeast side of Rainier looms an ominous feature from this event. Let's take a closer look at Rainier here. Okay, now when you look at Rainier here, again, this is from the, this is a view from the east side looking at the northeast side of Rainier. And notice the kind of triangular pyramidal feature there. What is that? Well, it's called Steamboat Prow. But what it is, is a chunk of rock there. But what's it still doing there? It's a massive amount of material. Why doesn't the Rainier slope just continue on there? Well, that's showing us a huge gap of material that's missing. And the Steamboat Prow material is just the material that still remains from the Osceola mud flow. All the other stuff around and behind it is material that was removed in this massive Lahar event. Okay, so where did it all go? And how on earth did all of that from the east side reach Tacoma, which is on the west side? Well, we need to look again at Rainier's river valleys. Take a look at the rivers around Rainier. We see the White River actually wraps around and drains out right at Tacoma. Now, of course, back then there weren't the many millions of people frolicking in that portion of western Washington. Today, there's over 200,000 people just in Tacoma itself, plus all the little towns around In it. the case of Nevado del Ruiz, we know that nearly 75% of the population was killed. If that happened in Tacoma, that would be over 150,000 people. But wait a minute. That's not likely to happen, right? I mean, 
we would have some warning and we would do evacuations. Well, this is true. However, think about the traffic on I-5 during a weekday at rush hour around Tacoma. How easy would it really be to move that many people? That's one of the big concerns when we think about evacuating around these volcanic regions and the warnings we would have. So what types of warnings would we have? Well, scientists that have studied this look at estimations based on how fast lahars move. And lahars can travel up to like 50 to 100 miles per hour. Well, that only gives us an hour or two for that material to reach the towns around Rainier and even as far as Tacoma. And you thought rush hour was bad enough all the way up to the 512 intersection on a Thursday at 5 p.m.? Try a Thursday at 5 p.m. when Rainier is about to go off. Now something else that we should be concerned about is the fact that lahars can occur outside of, of a major eruption event. We can have other things that trigger a lahar or a massive mud flow uh, from the volcano that can pose a threat. Another issue that we have is that some of you might be thinking, well, sweet, I mean, Seattle's in the clear, all the other towns to the north are in the clear for these types of events, and all the ash is moving to the east, so we should be good. But remember, the Cascades don't just include Mount Rainier. There's a whole line of volcanoes, and they are all capable of producing similar major and deadly lahar events and the rock deposits tell us that they have produced lahars in the past and similar to the rainier river valleys we looked at all of those also have rivers that flow out towards those heavily populated centers so there you have it a closer look at mount rainier and the hazards associated with an eruption who knew it turns out it's not necessarily those traditional eruption materials and events that we have to necessarily worry about but more so something most people don't often think about the massive mud flows or lahars and we now know that tacoma actually is sitting right in the way of a potential massive lahar in fact tacoma is is sitting atop sediment that was built up from old lahar events and all the other towns in western washington are also not in the clear because of all those other volcanoes we have mount baker glacier peak of course rainier and mount st helens but going on down into oregon even uh, we have mount adams portland area might have some things to worry about with that as well all the way down to california with mount shasta all of these volcanoes have full potential of producing deadly lahars uh, so we'll be looking at some other features as well i'll be taking a look at some of these other volcanoes and talking about those as well as something else associated with the volcano um, the existence of the volcanoes which is the fault that's outside uh, of the west coast sitting there looming it's called the cascadia fault zone which has a potential of producing large tsunamis We'll be taking a look at that here on Let's Go Geo. So if you're not subscribed, please subscribe. Join me on adventures in geology and geography and exploring this amazing planet. I'll see you guys there.